right, so this one is going to be how we put everything all together and finalize our uh, safety PLC program. So a couple things to look out for here. Number one, one of the final steps in validating your safety system. Number two, uh, can safety PLC logic be monitored once it is locked? We're going to talk about locking the system. Uh, number three, what are some other types of safety PLC blocks that can be used? We're going to show you an actual uh, real life safety PLC program that I did a couple years ago. We'll have a look at that one. And then what are the differences with some of the other types of blocks that you can use for programming because the program we're going to look at actually uses some different blocks than just the uh, the two blocks that I showed you in this sample program that we did for this lab. Uh, so let's look at our logic over here. So we went all through the redundant input, redundant output, how we put all that stuff together. So once you get all this logic programmed, you're going to take it to your machine and test it. So part of the testing and validation process, uh, we talked about we need to make sure all of our logic actually is written properly and it works. So you'll need to go to every single safety device, basically toggle that device. So if it's an e-stop, press the e-stop. You want to see does that e-stop actually shut down what it's supposed to shut down. Pull that e-stop back out again. It shouldn't restart until you restart it the proper way. Uh, and then the other thing we're going to want to do is does the block actually function to detect all the fault conditions that it should. So what you should be doing with these things is because every device is a two-channel device, you should be going and actually removing wires from these devices. So there should be two wires, two input wires coming off of each stop. You will take one wire, unscrew it, remove it, and once you remove it, the PLC should detect that a wire has been removed, and that block should go into a fault condition, right? Because now your two inputs do not agree. You have one that is on, one that is off. So you should not be able to, your block should fault out. It should not be able to be restarted either. Okay, so you're going to want to do that for every wire in your fault, in your safety system. Remove channel A, that should fail. Put it back on, you should have to reset the fault and then run it. Remove channel B, do the same testing. This is all part of the validation process. So we're going to have to do that for every single device. We're probably going to create a big checklist, go through validate, 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 check all that, check all your inputs, do that, check they shut down the zones like they should, check that everything faults like it should, check that all your outputs function properly, and once all that validation is complete, your safety system is now good. So once it is good, it is now time to shut it down and lock it so no one can make any changes to your logic. So the way that we do that, we're going to show that here. You can see right now, this says safety status. Safety is unlocked. So right now, we are free to just go in and make any kind of changes or edits that we want to make in this program. This is not allowed on a functioning safety system. So what we need to do is actually lock this system. So the way that we do that we go up here, and I'm going to say, actually, first of all, under safety, uh, a couple ways I can do this, but I'm going to go under properties, safety, I'm going to do a lock, sorry, first of all, I'm going to put this into program mode. Once I'm in program mode, now there's two things I can do here. Ultimately, I want to lock the logic because once it's locked, you cannot uh, go in and make any changes to this. First thing I'm going to do, though, is generate the safety signature. So if I say generate the safety signature, what this is going to do, and we'll look at this in a second, this is actually going to create a code and a timestamp that goes with this. So you are going to record this uh, safety signature, and this is basically your verification of this is the code when I left it. So when I validated the system and locked it, I created this safety signature. This is like you signing a document, and this is the code that was in there. 
If someone were to go in and make changes to this, they would need to, number one, they would need to have the password in order to do it, but the customer is probably going to be left with the password. But if they were to make changes, they would have to unlock it. They need to delete the safety signature and they can make changes and then lock the system again, but it will create a new signature. So you can always tell if someone has gone back and actually changed the safety system or if they've just even just unlocked it because the, the safety signature will be different. So now what I'm going to do is lock this system. So I need to put in the password. So I've created a password for this. And now I'm going to lock it. Now you will notice here that once I lock this and go back into run mode, this logic and it's difficult to see on this screen, but this logic is all gray. If we look at the main program, the standard logic, this has a nice white background. Safety logic all now has a gray background. Anytime you see gray background logic, that means this is logic you cannot edit. Okay, so if I want to click anywhere here, like if I click on this rung here, I can double click that. I can't do anything with that. Okay. I cannot click that and make it come on. So I can still monitor this logic. I can look at it. So if I want to come in here and look at the logic, see what's going on, I can do that with the safety program, but I cannot make any changes to it if it is locked. Now, if I want to look here, if I go to controller properties and under safety, you'll see safety signature right here. This has a time. So that's a time and date stamp. And then this big long code here, that is the actual safety signature that has been generated. You can copy that. Uh, copy it to your clipboard or whatever, write it down, paste it wherever you want, put it in an email, whatever it is, but that is the unique signature to at the time when you locked this. So that is your verification that this is the way the, stat, the system was at the time when I was finished with it and left you with it. Okay, so if anyone were to try to make changes to this, you can always check what is the current signature that's in the PLC versus what was it when I left, and you can tell if somebody has messed with that. And this is basically your legal uh, defense of what was the software when I left it. Okay, so remember how we talked about all the different things that a safety system has to do. It has to be able to be locked out and protected. You need to be able to validate uh, that the logic is good. You need to be able to check that people can't mess with the wiring. It should shut down. If that happens, all devices need to be dual channel. Uh, and all devices should be redundant for the output. So everything we've done here covers all those bases. So this is a valid safety system. Okay, so that is how we would apply a safety system to the PLC. So I am going to actually unlock this now. I'm going to say delete safety signature and unlock. You can see if I don't put in the password, it won't let me do it. I need to put in the password. Delete the safety signature, yes. Now this goes back into a mode where I can edit it. But you will also see that safety signature is now gone. Okay, so if I was to try to change this now and relock it again, I would be creating a new safety signature. Okay. So that is a wrap up of this general safety PLC. Now let's have a look at another program that uses this. Okay, so this is a program that I did a couple of years ago. Uh, this is from a machine. I can give you a brief explanation of what this machine does. You'll get an idea of the scale of what this is doing. This is basically taking uh, castings, so uh, iron castings, bins of castings. It has 
So it's basically three sections, uh, some doors that raise up. So six doors all together raise up. You put in a big bin full of iron castings that are hot, load them in with a forklift, close the door, and a big fan comes on, runs for a certain amount of time. And then after a certain amount of time, fan shuts off, door opens up, and you can unload the bin again. Not doing a whole lot. That's not a lot going on. I will show you this program. There's probably about, I'm going to guess, probably about 5,000 lines of code in this program to do that. Uh, so we basically have six doors that move up and down and three big fans that run. And that's how much code is involved in doing that. So standard logic. We got this thing called global program, communication, the actual motion stuff, and then this GM spec things. So the majority of the code here is basically handling either communication with HMIs, communication with uh, the GM information systems, or things like that. There is a very small amount of code here called 5run. This you would recognize. It is very similar to what we've done in class. So you'll see that we have a precondition, which is very much like our uh, auto condition safety or okay to move and then a command so auto manual gives us a command an output line an imposition and status and that's basically our five rung logic that we're using uh, like we do in our class so we basically got cell one door open cell one door close Cell 2 door open, cell 2 door close, cell 3 door open, cell 3 door close. And then we got fan number 1, start and stop, fan 2, start and stop, and fan 3, start and stop. That is really the, the motion logic that we have here. Uh, so that takes up about 100 lines to run our HMI is about 400 lines. So that's just making the screen work. And then lots of other code that we have here. So you can see all of that. So then on top of that, we have our safety program. Now this is gonna look pretty familiar to what you've seen. So we've got e-stops, light curtains, safety doors, and then we've got some zones. And this safe off is actually the output so we control. So let's look at some of the blocks that are being used in here. The rest of everything down here is just getting fault codes out of those blocks so we can display them on the HMI. That's one of the things with these blocks. You can actually get the fault codes out of them. So if you lose channel A on a block, you can actually get a fault that says channel A fault. But you need to do a lot of, H, a lot of coding to be able to get those things out. So let's look at eStop. So there's a little bit of upfront logic here, but we are using this block here, which is called DCST. So it works a lot like the uh, the RIN block that we were using, the redundant input, but with a couple little added features to it. So we still have channel A, channel B, those are our two inputs. We have a reset just like we had before. Uh, we've got a couple other things here. We have a test uh, where we can actually do a test on the block. This has a discrepancy time. Now on the RIN block, it's always 500 millimeters of the default. This one, you can actually set that yourself. So you can make that default whatever type you want. Uh, you can determine what the input type is. So equivalent or complementary. Equivalent means these two inputs both need to be the same all the time. Complementary means one is always high, one is one is on, one is off. They should always be opposite each other instead of always both the same. So some devices will always give you one signal that is on, one signal that is off, and they should those two signals should work opposite each other. 
that would be a complementary signal. So this block will work with that type of signal. Uh, and then some of these things too. The cold start type is basically the well, what do you want to do when the PLC first powers on? Do you want the block to be set and ready to go? Or do you want to ha actually have to go around and push the e-stop, pull it back out, and do a reset on it? How do you want it to handle first initial power-up? This is very important when you have a lot of safety gates or something like that. One thing we found, if you have like 100 safety gates on a system, and you download the program, and then we'll put the program in in program mode and then come back again do you want to have to go around and actually open and close a hundred different safety doors and reset them all or do you want to them to just say default state is going to be they're just going to work uh, so that is the cold start type uh, so this we have it just as automatic so it'll just come up in the, in the on state so this is the dcst block so that is one of the blocks if you look up here under safety DCST, dual channel input stop with test. Okay, so that's one of the more advanced type blocks. And the other thing we liked about this one, you, it's very good to get a lot of different fault codes out of it. I think this is one of the reasons why we like using this one as well. But we're using that same block for e-stops, using it for the light curtains as well. Using it for our safety doors, you can see for the safety doors that actually used a complementary input type. Uh, and then on our outputs, these safe offs were our outputs. We'll actually look at the zones first. Zones, pretty straightforward. All we had here was E stops. One, two, three, e stops, ready for reset. And then for safe offs, which is our outputs, we're using this CR out. And CR out stands for output instruction here. See what that stands for here. Configurable redundant output. So very much like the uh, the uh, R out uh, thing we were using, but we have a little bit of more configuration with it. Again, we could set the uh, feedback reaction time. So how much of a time delay do you expect between when the time that you uh, turn on the output, you should actually expect to see those input signals come back on, those feedback signals. You can set that. Uh, the actuate is the enable signal. Uh, the feedback type, positive or negative, just like we had before. And then most of these other things, we've got, a, we've got uh, some different things that we'd expect to see there. Okay, so very similar to the block we were using before. So that kind of gives you an idea, basically, that is real life, real program using all these things. You can see the program does get pretty big, even with just a couple devices. Uh, a lot of this is trying to pull all the fault codes out of this. Uh, so about four lines are getting fault codes, basically getting a channel A fault, channel B fault, uh, an other fault, and a cycle device fault. This would be, this actually requires you to cycle the device to make it work again. Uh, but that is a real program and you can kind of see how big of that, how much code is involved in this, but a lot of it is redundant code over and over again. And a lot of this is things that you would recognize very easily, uh, for coding. Okay. So that is a real safety program. So that should give you a pretty good overview of how to implement safety PLC. Okay. So getting back to where we're at, have a look for those questions. And that should be it for safety PLC. All right.
We'll see you next week.